All right, this is Honors Algebra 2 Pre-Calculus. We're doing section 5.1 in Pre-Calc, which is using fundamental trigonometric identities. So there's about a dozen trig identities that I'm going to ask you to memorize uh, to help you get through Pre-Calc and Calc. There are many more that you won't need to memorize but should be able to use if you're provided with them. Uh, so in most cases, in a pinch, you can logic your way to some of these other ones from the original dozen or so that we're going to learn. Uh, so think of trig identities as facts that you use to change something into something else that is more useful but equivalent. So we're going to walk through a real-world example example of that. All right, so let's say you have a $20 bill and you want to snag a soda for a dollar from a vending machine. So uh, this is overly optimistic that the soda only costs a dollar, but bear with me. So it won't take your $20 bills uh, or dollar bill, and it only takes dollar bills. It doesn't take uh, any sort of like, you know, phone payment or credit card. So how are you going to make this work? Well, you have these facts, right? You know that there are uh, four or five dollar bills in a 20 and there are uh, five one dollar bills in a five, right? So these are facts, just like those trig identities, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to take your 20 and you're going to make change, right? You're going to take your 20 and split it into four five dollar bills. And then you're going to say, oh, hey, I can take one of those five dollar bills and split it into five one dollar bills. And hey, I can take one of those single dollars and buy myself a soda. So you started with $20 and you ended up with something equivalent to $20, right? You ended up with three fives four ones and your soda, right? So it's equivalent, but it looks different. That's what trig identities do. We take uh, a statement and we make it into something that is more functional for our purposes. Maybe those purposes are that we need to factor or we need to solve something, but just like that $20 bill wasn't letting you get a soda, but by reworking it and making it three fives and uh, five ones, you were able to get your soda. That's the same idea here, all right? So that's, that's the idea. So what is the soda in this situation? The soda is that you're gonna be asked to do something to an expression. Uh, and it usually involves some kind of factoring or solving. Uh, sometimes you have to rewrite an expression to make it factorable or solvable, right? Uh, so that's kind of the gist, right? So let's go ahead and walk through it. So here are some fundamental trig identities, and we know some of these already from, uh, from chapter four, right? Uh, so sine and cosecant are reciprocals, meaning that, uh, and so I made them one rule. I numbered these just so that I could easily refer to them. So uh, the reciprocal identity is sine is one over the cosecant, or the reverse is also true. The cosecant is one over the sine. Uh, same thing with cosine and secant. They are reciprocals. So cosine is, is one over the secant, and secant is one over the cosine. Uh, same thing with tangent and cotangent. They are reciprocals. So tangent is one over the cotangent, and cotangent is one over the tangent. We've also seen these quotient identities. Tangent is sine over cosine. Cotangent is cosine over sine. Notice I'm not saying the thetas in all of this. It could be a theta or a u or an x or an alpha or a beta, but you never have an empty trig function, right? So it can't be sine of theta equals one over cosecant of alpha. That's not how it works. They have to be the same angle. So whatever these angles are, they have to be the same. I would suggest making note cards for these, right, where you put this on one side of the note card and this on the other side of the note card so you can quiz yourself. You don't have to. Uh, you could use something like Quizlet, but I'm going to suggest that making note cards is a good idea. Uh, Pythagorean identities, right? So uh, again, I numbered them for easy reference. Sine squared plus cosine squared is definitely the big one, right? So this is this is the one that, that you definitely want to have memorized because you can figure out 7 and 8 by dividing this number 6 by something else. So, uh, and honestly, that's how I have 7 and 8. I don't actually have 7 and 8 memorized. I kind of logic through them every single time. If you took number 6 and you divided everything by cosine squared, you'd get a sine squared theta over a cosine squared theta plus a cosine squared theta over a cosine squared theta equals a 1 over a cosine squared theta. Well, that's tangent, right? Sine over cosine is tangent, so that's tangent squared theta. Cosine squared over cosine squared would be a 1. And 1 over cosine is a secant. Uh, sorry, that's an equal, not a plus. Uh, 1 over cosine squared is a sec, or over cosine is a secant, so this is a secant squared. And sure enough, there's that formula, right? By the same token, if I took number 6 and divided everybody by sine squared, right? Sine squared theta divided by sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta divided by sine squared theta plus 1 over sine squared theta. Well, sine squared divided by sine squared is 1. Cosine over sine is a cotangent, so if they're both squared, it's a cotangent squared. Uh, and then, uh, so again with the equals, my bad. Uh, and then 1 over sine would be a cosecant, so 1 over sine squared is a cosecant squared. And sure enough, there's that formula. So I would recommend having at least number 6 memorized. I've honestly never memorized 7 and 8. I just logic my way through them. Um, okay, so then there, your book actually lists six different co-function rules, right? Um, you can memorize them if you want. Uh, I don't. I have one of them memorized. I know that if I have a function, uh, 
uh, evaluated at pi over 2 minus theta, it's the same as the co function evaluated at theta and vice versa. So sine and cosine, right? Tangent and cotangent. Right, uh, secant and cosecant. Right now, you might say, okay, why is this true? Well, I can actually show you pretty easily with um, with sine and cosine. So, if we look at our right triangle, and I call this theta, because this angle is a right angle, meaning it is pi over two radians, and we know that all of the angles in a circle add up to to pi radians or one eighty degrees. Right, this missing angle, right, this angle I don't know. This angle has to be what would happen if I took so so the whole circle right the whole or I'm sorry the whole triangle adds up to pi radians so theta plus the mystery angle right I don't know what that mystery angle is I'm just going to call it alpha theta plus alpha plus pi over two has to add up to pi radians right so pi over two right because that's two pi over two uh, equals theta plus alpha so alpha is really just pi over two minus theta so what this is saying is if this is angle theta, this is the other angle that's not theta, right? So pi over two minus theta is literally the other angle. Well, it makes sense that the, so once you realize that, right, the sine of pi over two minus theta, right? So uh, I'm just gonna call this A, B, and C for a sec, right? So here's theta. That means that this angle is pi over 2 minus theta, right? Well, the sine of pi over 2 minus theta should be the side opposite that, which would be A over C. Well, that would be the same as the cosine of regular theta, because that would be the adjacent side over the opposite. So the reason that these are true is because literally pi over 2 minus theta means the other angle in the triangle that is not theta. So if that helps at all, that's kind of the logic behind why it's true. So um, I don't actually have all of these written memorized. I just memorized that the function and the cofunction, right? Uh, if you do pi over 2 minus theta, it's the other angle in the triangle that's not theta. All right, and then the last one, even an odd trig functions, right? And we've addressed this a little bit in a previous video, uh, I believe in chapter four. Um, but what it means to be an even function is if you put the opposite of the input in, you get the regular old function back out. There are only two even trig functions. Um, they are the two that only depend on x, right? So this is the x on the unit circle and one over the x on the unit circle. All of these involve the y on the unit circle right? Because it's, it's y in the unit circle or 1 over the y in the unit circle or x over y. So, so, so they, these only involve x on the unit circle. Any of the ones that involve y are odd functions. What it means if you put a negative of theta in an odd function is you get a negative back out in front of the function. If you put a negative theta inside an even function, you just get the regular function back. Uh, all right, so we're going to go ahead and use some of this stuff because I feel like uh, you can always pause the video and go back and get these trig identities. So simplify the expression. So this is a super duper vague direction. Um, in this problem, basically, I'm going to warn you, hey, you should be able to get this down to being a single trig function. So to simplify this, I'm going to try factoring out a GCF. I see that I can factor out a sine of x, and I'm left with a cosine squared x minus 1. So my brain says, oh, this is probably one of those Pythagorean identities, right? Because I see a squared, and I see a minus 1. So I think about my IDs, and I think, oh, I know that sine squared, I'm going to use a different variable here just to show that I'm not talking about the same formula, right? Like, this is a fact, right? And this is something I'm simplifying. So sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. There's a couple different ways to do this. Right, one option is to solve for, well, you could actually, you've already solved for one. One option is you could just replace this one right here and then clean it up. Another option is you could try to manipulate this and move it around to figure out what cosine squared minus one is equal to. So me personally, I think that's usually what I do. Um, I would probably uh, essentially subtract the one over and subtract the sine squared over and I would get that cosine squared x minus one is a negative sine squared. So I would probably replace this entire thing with a negative sine squared. The other way to do it is what I just described, which is just replacing the one. So if you chose to do it, oh, and I did, didn't mean to use an x again. I said I specifically used a different variable and then I didn't. My bad. I thought that the problem was thetas. Anyway, so I was trying to prove to you that it's sort of a separate piece of information. So uh, if I wanted to, I could replace this there are two ways to do it. I could either just replace the one, so it's minus, and then instead of a one, I could put sine squared plus cosine squared, and that would be fine. And then I could clean it up by distributing the negative. That would give me a sine x times cosine squared x minus sine squared x minus cosine squared x. These two are the same thing, so they sum to zero. I get sine x times a negative sine squared x, 
which gives me a negative sine cubed of x. And that's my simplified answer. The other way to do it is to notice that what I said here, where I solved my, my trig identity first, actually spits me right down to this spot, and then I could get to this final answer. Either of those are fine. So again, I'm not really going to ask you vaguely just to simplify on a test, because I, I think it's too vague, right? Here, that's why I gave you the hint that said, hey, you should be able to get down to a single trig function. Uh, we'll have a couple examples like this. You might see an example of just being told to simplify on the homework, but in general, on a test, I'm going to give you more direction, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. So same idea, simplify the trig expression. Again, this is very vague, but you should be able to get this down to a single trig function. So the first thing I spot is that there is a GCF. Right? If I take out a tangent squared x, I'm left with 1 minus sine squared x. And my brain says, wait a sec, this is probably a Pythagorean identity. So over here, I'm going to do a little bit of work with my trig ID. And I say, oh, look, I know sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is 1. I could just subtract the sine over and recognize that this entire thing is actually just a cosine squared. Right, I could use this. So I say, okay, cool, this is a cosine squared of x. Uh, this was a tangent squared of x, right? So I'm pretty sure tangent squared is sine squared over cosine squared times a cosine squared. These are on different floors and it's multiplication, so they cancel. And all of this, after all that work, simplifies to a sine squared of x. All right. Okay, so E2, also kind of vague instructions. We're going to simplify the expression. Uh, again, here it's going to get down to a single trig function. So this time there is no GCF. I can't factor. But what I notice is I have two fractions to add, right? And if this were with just numbers or even just with x as the denominator, I would think, oh, hey, I need a common denominator, right? That's what my brain says. I need a common denominator. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply the first fraction by this guy's denominator, so sine over sine, right? And I'm going to multiply the second fraction by this denominator, 1 plus cosine and 1 plus cosine. All right, so what happens when I do that is I get a sine squared x plus, when I distribute this cosine, I get a cosine x plus cosine squared x. On the bottom, I seem to have a sine of x times a 1 plus cosine of x. Now, if I clean up the numerator a little bit, I notice that these two together, if I, if I put them in a slightly different order, these two are a trig identity, right? I know that sine squared x plus cosine squared x is a 1. So I can replace that with a 1 plus the cosine that was left by itself. Well, that's convenient because the denominator's already factored, and the denominator has a 1 plus cosine x. So I get that this is a 1 over sine x, which is the same as a cosecant. And I get that this is a little bit tough, and you get better at it as you go. Uh, you start to see what options you have. And we're going to spend some more time in the next video talking about your options. So go ahead and try P2. Uh, same concept, right? Uh, you're going to see if you can get this, again, very vague direction, but you're going to see if you can get this down to a single trig function. So um, here it's a little tricky because I can't factor, right? There's no GCF. And it doesn't look like there's any fractions, because in the last example, we had a fraction. Um, but there actually is a fraction. So there is a fraction. I can make this a fraction with common denominators, because cotangent is actually a cosine over sine. So this is a sine x plus cosine over sine times a cosine. Well, that means that I do have a fraction. I have a sine over 1, and I have a cosine squared over a sine. So I need a GCF to get, uh, or I'm sorry, I need a common uh, denominator. So to get a common denominator, I need to multiply this fraction by this guy's denominator. And technically, I would multiply this fraction by this guy's denominator, but we don't really care. Like, no one cares. Right? No one cares because it's a 1, so, so it doesn't matter. So I end up getting sine squared x plus cosine squared x all over a sine. And then I have this thought where I remember, oh, hey, this is definitely a trig identity. Sine squared plus cosine squared is a 1. So I'm going to get that this is a 1 on top of a sine x, which is going to be a cosecant x. All right. So 
We can also use this thing called trig substitution to make really ugly algebraic expressions look like pretty simple trig expressions. So we're going to go ahead and, uh, and walk through how to do this. We'll see this skill again in AP Calculus. All right, so we're going to use trigonometric substitution uh, to write the algebraic expression uh, as a function of theta. And we're, we're told that we're in quadrant 1, right, because that's what 0 to pi over 2 would mean, right? So we are told that x should be 2 cosine squared theta, or sorry, 2 cosine theta. So I'm just going to take this and replace the x squared with that value. So this is the square root of 64 minus a 16. And then x squared would be a 4 cosine squared theta, right? So that's the square root of 64 minus a 64 cosine squared theta. I think if I factor this, I have a 64 in front of a 1 minus cosine squared which means I have the square root of a 64. And then recall that we know a trig identity for this. There's a trig identity that says sine squared x plus cosine squared x is 1. So sine squared should be 1 minus cosine squared. That means I can replace this with a sine squared theta, right? Well, now I get that this is the square root of 64. Uh, times the square root of sine squared. Both of those are perfect squares, so I get that this is 8 sine of theta. Um, I technically would need an absolute value, but I was told I was in quadrant 1. Everybody's positive, so everything's positive in quadrant 1, which is why we were told that information. So I can simplify this to just be 8 sine of theta. Nice, happy, simplified version. Uh, so what we did is we took an algebraic expression, we wrote it as a trig function of theta. All right, let's do one last problem. So same idea, you're going to replace, uh, again, we're in quadrant one, which just means everybody's positive. So, so that's all, all that we need to know about that. I'm going to go ahead and replace x with a 2 secant. So that means that this square root of x squared minus 4 is going to be a square root of 4 secant squared uh, theta minus 4 right? Uh, I can factor out a 4 and be left with a secant squared theta minus 1. Now remember that's a trig identity, right? There is a trig ID that says tangent squared, uh, I don't care if you use x or theta or whatever, because you're not going to plug it in as x here, right? But there's a trig identity that says that tangent squared plus 1 is secant squared. So I can replace a secant squared minus 1 with a tangent squared. That means that this is a square root of 4, times a square root of tangent squared, which means I get 2 tangent theta. And again, I don't need the absolute value. Technically, this would be an absolute value, but I'm in quadrant 1. And in quadrant 1, everything's positive. And that's it for our first video.